Uh, here, our Joe had talked about everything about kayak, so I'll leave those to you to look at. Here, I think I'll focus on mainly two or three things. Uh, one would be my view on why AI is so attractive to me. And the second would be how kayak can uh, actually several things help you understand better, not just for the exam. Hopefully for eventual, if you are in a business, then um, understanding of what actually is going on will be very useful. And the third would be do something quick on the demo lecture. So you know if you take a class here, uh, how can it compare with two hours here versus 20 hours you can do at home on your own. So we'll do those three here. Uh, first thing about me, I had sort of a, a wavering path along my career. So I was an accountant at first. Um, I didn't really like accounting. I think it's very boring. But comparatively, I try to make accounting fun because I teach accounting as well in some universities. And it's not easy. For AI, it's very good. I think it's so much fun because if you go out to any banks, anything right now, that's all they're selling. Uh, so the market is growing very big. In terms of finance, I do risk management as well for FRM and PRM. Um, I, I have a few years off, um, a few years back, and so I was doing, considering either accounting further, finance further, AI further, and I made the right choice. AI is so much more fun just because new things come up every day. While finance is not dead, but it's really around the same, it's getting very efficient. So uh, products are similar as before, uh, development not so much, salary and the margin is not very high as well. So AI is good because it's developing a lot. Uh, if you need to go further, uh, there's a lot more opportunities. Um, so that is where I'm coming from. Uh, the main thing, last few years, I have gone mainstream for AI. Uh, if you look back a decade ago, you go and talk to a pension fund and you say, I'm a hedge fund. They would kick you out because they don't want to be associated with you. It's too high risk. But last few years, it's been accepted. Uh, risk might not be low, but it's not correlated. So they have certain safe investments. They add in AI. It's actually better. Investment return, similar or slightly higher, but risk actually lower because it's not correlated. So now many pension funds are buying. Many I individuals are buying. So if you go to HSBC or Hang Seng now, you can buy derivatives at uh, a related products through online without any real person. It's just a time deposit. So there's big demand and big supply. So in terms of growing market, it's actually very big. Except many people don't know it. They thought it's just simple products because it's been mainstream, but it's really AI related overall. So in terms of going into the business, it's fun, high growth potential, exciting things. Um, so it's actually a pretty good business to be in. Uh, in terms of what members say, Joe had went through that before. So I won't go through this again, but um, I think one of the fun thing for AI investment is that it's more commodity. For CFA or normal, I guess, mutual funds or regular investment, it's, um, it's sort of competitive. For AI, it's more personal skill and you find people actually, um, I was in Shanghai before you and with, I was at uh, Tao Tung University as well. They have a pretty good um, uh, AI program. When I sit with other kayak members and the students there, we talk about everything there is. They talk about the strategies. They're very open in terms of what they do. So we learn a lot from each other as well because it's, it, there's money on the table. There's no need to be uh, fiercely competitive. Uh, it's really more like a game of who's, who's doing better, how we think about the strategies, our views on, on the world. So it's actually very fun. Uh, so these are the main topic outlines. Let me put this in terms of what you end up doing if you go to the class. For level one, you get a broad-based topic. So there's five main things you'll be tested in terms of asset class. That's how the topics are separated. So we have the real asset. That means real estate and some timberland related. You have hedge funds. Here you have, you're shown the various strategies of how they operate. We have commodities. That is more like your trading. 
you buy and sell gold through futures or other instruments, and private equity, which is very different from all the rest, and structured products. So these are your derivatives-based products like uh, credit default swap. So these are the five main topics. Um, you see the same five in level one and two, but just different way you see it. In level one, you see the five topics in a more flat structure. Uh, not much in-depth exposure, but very broad based on what the structure is, what the asset class does, and how the manager makes money. In level two, you'll be doing each of these in much higher depth. So you'll be asked in within each of these asset class, details calculations, more in-depth focus. A lot of the more uh, uh, basic things will not be asked again, but you're supposed to know anyway because otherwise you can't do further in more depth in the blue topics. And in level two, you also have, let me see where it is, you have also the right written part. So you have three essays, one on ethics or professional standards. So a little bit of variations between the two levels. In terms of study time, um, uh, it's pretty similar to what uh, kayak, uh, say you need to take depends on your background so some students take a lot less because they have been doing this or they know something about this some took much longer so it depends on how you study and what your knowledge level is uh, but they're pretty accurate in terms of the, the time this is for someone who took it before and didn't pass but i think it applies to someone that's new as well it's really relating to the opportunities i talked about earlier um, you, it's a high growth uh, industry, so doing it will be beneficial in, in terms of career-wise and interest-wise. This is for us. So here, um, I guess I can do it through the demo lecture. Uh, many things, when you look at the books later on, it's actually a very good book. It's interesting to read. Compared to accounting, it's like night and day. Uh, but doing it from a reading perspective, it's like reading an accounting book and a fiction novel. Right, you have many books on long-term capital management, many on, on various books about how groups work. It's like reading that. But here in our class, we try to focus on more on the interesting part of within the whole story, what is the main area of what went wrong or what is good, how they make money, uh, what are the key points. So uh, that's one place where we can save you time. The other is for a lot of maths, formula-based uh, uh, calculations, valuation, etc. The formula is not hard once you know how it works. So you can spend 10, 20, 30 hours reading over and over the same material, read the other topics, come back, read it again. You eventually get it hopefully, before the exam, but it'll take you a lot of time. Uh, in class, we'll go through how the formula work. So supposedly afterwards, you can go through the numbers and some can, you can even figure out what the answer should be approximately so you can have a much higher chance of getting the right answer once you know how the formula works in a much shorter time. So here, um, this will be something on what you would expect when you're studying. For calculations, there are two main parts in the curriculum. One is just reading. Reading how the strategy work, uh, reading what makes the, the, what risks there are in certain strategies. Those are, we'll go through in class, but not in here. For the calculation part, which is the other half, or the other part, um, normally there are two types of questions being asked. They try to have a good view of do you know the material and can you actually do it? Because you can memorize the formula or you can, but if you're real life doing it, if it's your money, you want to know what's going on and makes the right adjustment. Because in real life, everyone does it differently. There's no fixed formula. Some adjust it this way, some adjust it that way, some use uh, intuitive experience of you know, different way to different in and out points, etc. So here are two types of calculation questions. One is the more difficult to do, but mechanical. It will be like the private equity fees. We'll look at something later on on what's involved in a fee calculation. So these are uh, mechanical 
if you know how the system works, if you've done it a few times, then you can f figure out what it is. It, it's long, but it's mechanical. The other is more easy. You have a very short question, but it focuses on how the formula works in theory. So if you know the theory and the formula, and what's being put in, what effects it has, then it's very pretty, it's pretty straightforward. You can pretty much guess the answer almost without calculation, but you must have the background of why, what makes up the formula. So those are the two. Example would be, uh, it's called bin binomial tree. It's used very often in derivatives for more exotic ones. So it's used in the curriculum for two major areas in level two. Uh, one in level one. One is uh, the convertible bonds valuation. This is the major part for level two. Uh, you do the binomial tree calculation and check what is the mispricing for the bonds, and you buy it or sell it, and then how do you hedge all the risk and profit from the price difference? So it's a major part in level two. Uh, it's there's a, the tree formula, which uh, in theory is not hard once you know how the system works. The other is credit default swap. It starts in level one. So you do the calculations in one, and then more in-depth things in level two. So those are the easy but formula-based questions. This is the first type. So we're not going to go through all the fees, but for a private equity, there's tons of fee calculations. Just because um, it's like marriage. You marry someone you signed today, and you're stuck or you're happily stuck for you don't know how long, maybe two years, 10 years, 25 years, who knows. But private equity is similar. You sign something, it's actually worse than marriage because you, you sign up to give away your money. Hopefully get something more back at the end, but you sign and you are stuck for seven, 10, 12 years. So if you're giving the money away and you don't get it back until almost a decade later, I want to have different features in the fee structure to protect me when I'm giving them my money. So a lot of these relates to protection of the investor because they'll be out of the money for seven, 10 years and they don't have any say on what the guy buys. So some of these fees, management fees on committed amount. So you might, I might commit 10 billion and it's not drawn down on the first day, but I pay the 2% fees on the total amount I committed. With this organization fee when you start, uh, there's transaction fees and monitoring fees. So when the guy buy investments, he charge a fee to the firm that he buys. Uh, it's based on the deal size, not on your amount, because they use leverage. So there's some calculations, there's some offsets on between the transaction fees and the management fee offsetting and carry over. So there's tons of things you can do with a question on this. That's only on the ongoing fees. When the, when the private equity fund is finished, then the guy will calculate, well, I made so much money for you, I take a 20% cut in the profit. So when he calculate those, there are other things you can do. The hurdle rates, so pretty much uh, you take back a certain guarantee return first before he gets 20%. There's some clawback provision to prevent cheating on their part. So many, many things you can do with these. The other part is the binomial tree. So we mentioned two things earlier on, on theory-wise, how the binomial tree work. Uh, so these are, I guess it's easier to look at the book if you have a chance later on. So here, there are two parts for the demo lecture. As I mentioned earlier, it's hard to do the verbal part or the reading part here. So I have a feel on, uh, I guess, in terms of how much depth you see how much you have to read. The other is on calculation. The last part is on um, several questions. The purpose of those is to show, without doing any studying yet, just by common sense and basic finance knowledge, you can probably get three out of the five questions I give you. So 60% pass rate based on common sense knowledge that you can think of once you read the material here. So this is the first part. These are the, the reading or the verbal part in the curriculum. So a lot of these are definitional, and some will be used as input to the model. So here this is a, a part from level one on the credit default swap. So here it's like you're buying insurance. You 
you're afraid a bond or some investment will, will fall apart. So you buy insurance to make sure if they, if, they, if they blow up, you get your money back somehow. So here, these are the chance of blowing up in different levels. So here, in a, in a normal finance or CFA case, you just have a credit, credit risk, which is the risk of them not paying you back. But since now you're buying insurance, so you, want, you might want different types of medical, right? One just if you get sick normally, one for having severe illness, one for hospital only, one for life insurance. There's different levels of packaging for your insurance. The f I'll do the last one first. That one's the basic normal type uh, uh, movements of the price. So here, this is credit spread risk. It's market driven. So if the market move, competitors do something different, your, it might affect you. Right? So this is just how the price or the spread move with market movements. It might be something you have done, but it happens all the time. Every day, even if the market is closed, price up might still move. Second is a downgrade risk. So it's more severe, more serious. The uh, agency might come out and say, there's a chance you, I need to do a review on your performance. Normally, it's bad, right? So it might affect the price this way. So there's another risk someone might want to insure. So you want to make sure you calculate the chance of that happening even without him not paying you back. The last one is the, the common default risk they talk about. It's they don't pay you back. What can you do? It's a different risk level for our... Uh, curriculum, we don't do so much details. So here they use two models uh, to evaluate or determine the chance of any one of these three happening. So the first one is called structural. It's like your Goldman Sachs analyst. They do a whole 10,000 page spreadsheet on a firm or on whatever you want to buy and go through all the chance of the cash flow not enough to pay you back. So it's very similar, except the end result is not a target share price, but a chance of default. But very similar in terms of how they start and what they do. Uh, and the last one is reduced form. Here, it's the other way. In the first structural model, it's like a Goldman analyst saying, right now HSBC is 80 bucks. I think it's worth 120. So they do their own analysis and say, this is what they should be. I ignore the market price. For the reduced form, it's like your uh, option valuation. They say they start with the market price are correct. If it's correct, I back out the chance of default from that. So it's more formula based. For our cur curriculum, we only do the second one. The first one takes a lot of time and it's very in individualistic as well. So we do the reduced form and we use the binomial tree here and you plug in the market price, calculate and you get the chance of default from this reduced form. This is another place where AI is interesting. If you look at CFA, what they study in level one and two, you don't really see it real life. I mean, you study it, but people don't talk about it in the business. For these, these are actually what people do real life in the industry. So if you look at um, various webcasts, online discussion on the latest CDS development, some, there's, there's a webcast I think by GARP, which is the FRM uh, uh, organization. They have a guy come in and, and introduce CDS. And that is the model he used. I think it works for UBS or someone. But that is the model he used in the whole presentation on I'm doing this today. That's how we value our CDS when we price. If you call me, that's what I do to price. You're actually studying what they do real life, not some abstract concept they don't use uh, normally. So here these are the five questions. The first three, I'll give you some time to think about and try to get the right answer. The last two I'll give you, and you can go back and see if you can figure what they are. So here, this is the first one. Uh, here it's on real estate. So we have five different asset class. This is on the real asset. So real estate investment, which one most likely to benefit from inflation? So in the curriculum, inflation is the main thing that real estate can help you protect. So if you're investing, you're afraid of high inflation, Real estate is one of the things they recommend. So here, these are the three different things you can do when you buy property. 
So here, if you're afraid of high inflation later on, then you might want to do one of these. Right, so I'll give you a few minutes. So here, one of the, I guess for exam purpose, you want to check to see what answers are possible and which are not possible, right? If you're not sure what it is, you can cross out those that you know it's not for sure and narrow down your potential answers. So here we have um, inflation. So inflate, ooh, I think I torn this off. Let me put it back. Okay. So here for inflation, uh, there's two actually two angles. One is your revenue side, one is your one is your expense side. So revenue side would be if I buy this building and Kaplan is signed has signed a lease with me for the next ten years, so I would have an inflation index adjusting the rent I get. Right? So if I have high inflation in all of a sudden unexpected, then it would be good for me or bad for me. I signed the, the lease agreement for 10 years, and I put in, oh, I would have, if inflation is less than 10, I would have an adjustment between 2 and 8%, whatever indexing there is, like transportation, like MTR here. So if it's much higher in one year, and it's beyond what I expected when I signed it five years ago, my rent, my rent will lag behind. Right, inflation is getting higher, market rent is much higher, but I'm getting from Kaplan the same rent from before, adjusting for a you know, maxed out inflation adjustment. So if I'm receiving, then it's no good. On the, on the, on the cost side, it will be my mortgage. So here we have two mortgages here. One is adjustable rate, one is fixed rate. So it depends on which way the, the, the rate go. Right, so here, inflation is high, that would mean market rate also go up. Right? So it depends on whether it's adjustable or fixed. We'll see which one is better. So here in the property with in, in selection A with a long lease term, this is the revenue side. So if I have sudden unexpected inflation, it's not good for me right? because my lease income is stuck at a lower adjustment level over time while the market rate has gone up. For the last two, it's for the expense side. So now, these two are exact opposite. So you figure one out, you know the other is the right answer, if it's the first one is not. So here, uh, benefit from inflation. So adjustable rate means what I pay goes up and down with market. If market rates go down, it's good for me. I pay less. But if market rates go up like the question here, that's really no benefit for me. If I combine A and B, this, that, that's actually bad for me. My, my revenue st gets stuck in a low adjustment rate. My, the expense side keeps going up with market rate. So A and B, both no good. Combined, worse. So here C would be the best one. Right? Market rate gone up, but I pay the same fixed rate I had from several years ago. Right? So this is A, B, and C. C would be the right answer here. We're okay? So this one is not relatively difficult uh, of what you see. This one I'll let you read. Um, this is more on the formula. Right? So here uh, I'll let you read first. For some background on this, real estate and private equity, the price tend to be estimated just because you don't buy and sell buildings all the time. So if I need a mark-to-market -market value, it's estimated or appraised by agents. For private equity, it's the same. He holds your money for eight years. In the middle, you ask, how much is it worth? He'll estimate it for you. So here it's called the smoothed or leg price, where you ask them for the price, it might not be the actual market price, but an estimation. So it's smoothed or lagged. So here we have this case. Within the curriculum, you have about three to four formulas to how to readjust or unsmooth it. 
right? Because when I when I check, I want the actual market price for my return calculation. But now when I ask, it gave me a, a smooth price. I want to unsmooth it using some formula. Here we haven't don't, we don't have a formula here, but it's effectively saying 0.6 of the actual price change is incorporated into this price that they tell you. So we have similar formulas. Some have one, some have two, some have various these factors. So once you know how this works, they all work the same way. This is a question asking, uh, the price difference is $12. So effectively, the guy that tell you the, the, the appraised value of the building, say it went up by $12. And based on the historical study, they say 0.6 of the actual market price change gets stuck onto the appraised price, while the other 0.4 lacked. Actually, 0.6 go in. So this would be the same as asking. I have there are 12 slices of pizza on the table. Those are the leftovers. The pizza pie came, you have a full pizza, someone ate some of it, you walk in and you count 12 pizzas left, and you ask, what's the total? And he tell you, oh, this is 60% of the original pizza, I ate 40% of it. So he didn't tell you how many pizzas originally, but he tell you 12 left, that's 60% of it, so originally it will be, in this case, 12 divided by 0.6, and you have a $20 actual price change. Original pizza, 20 slides. And he ate eight of those, and 12 is left. Similar concepts in terms of the lag. Right? So these are pretty uh, similar lag formulas you see. If you look at the answer, if you know how, this, how the formula work, you don't actually need it. Because if you know $12 is only 60% of the original, like your pizza, 12 slices are 60% original, original slice must be more than 12. It cannot be less. For the answer, these are all below 12. So you know A, B, and D cannot be the right answer anyway. So you can get this without calculating once you know how the formula works. This is more of a second type. right? You know the formula, you know how it works, you don't even have to calculate. You can actually eyeball the answer if you have more than one that's over 12, right? The last one, this is the third one. This is more on combining common sense with a little bit of accounting and a little bit of finance. So here we have many triggers in AI. Just like when you trade, you can buy or sell, you can, uh, uh, you can hold or short something. So many, many of the questions depends on how it's asked. Many keywords you have to pick up. If not, you get the exact opposite answer. Right? If they say buy, you do sell, you get the right number, but it's plus or negative, just exact opposite. So this is some case similar. It's more than one binary steps as well. So here, first eliminate potential answers. So here we have the strategies is best. So I need to, to figure out what's best given this. In the curriculum, many of the stories they give will have similar things. They would ask, this is how I see the world. This is what I think will happen. I want to make tons of money. What's the best way to do it? There's always more than one way, right? Some more efficient, some less efficient. So the guy that are less efficient still make money, just not so much. Or when the market goes the other way, he lose more. When someone is smarter, more efficient, they build a higher return with less capital, right? So these are all similar things. Some might work, some might not. Some better than the other. So here, uh, one of the first triggers we see is hedge. So many of these words, are put in there, it doesn't seem important, but it kills some answers. First, if you do some, you know, hatch accounting or other things, when you want to hatch something, you want to buy and sell whatever it is, so when 
all hell break loose, it helps you, right? So when you look at the answers, we have options, 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 and futures. So what you need is, for futures, it's okay. Potentially, it might give you the opposite effects. But for options, um, if you buy it, then you have a choice to do something. It'll help you, your choice, right? When you're in a bad shape, you choose, I would go to the hospital now. So it helps you. But when you sell an option, you're selling away your choices. So like hedge accounting, you have the same criteria. When you sell options, it can never be a hedge, right? Because you're selling away your choice to, to protect yourself. So it's actually worse, it's a non-hedge. So just from this, the option might be right, but selling it cannot be a right hedge as a strategy, except uh, the, the um, caller for interest, or, uh, but it's beyond the here. Normally, selling options, it's, it's not a hedge strategy. So now I have something left. Same as before. Uh, here, um, I'll do the full thing, but once you go through the book, it'll be straightforward. Here we have actually several uh, characters here, and depends on who it is, make a difference. First is the producer. So think of this is the farmer, and you have a pig. So this will be in the trading part as well, a similar setup. This is, um, I guess, um, if it's a farmer, then this would be, I guess, the bacon people. They sell sausages. In, so you see the product in a supermarket. So normally you have these two characters in the market. Farmer is the producer. They actually grow the pig, raise the pig, or raise the wheat to sell. So for them, they sell the pig, it's a revenue. The pork price up or down, it's their income. The, these are the users. They actually use pig as the input. So for them, the, the pork price is the expense because they buy the pig and make it into bacon, so you buy. Right? So in this case, when you see producer, they have exact opposite outcome as the user. So here, what I want to check next is for producer, if I want to hedge, meaning when, when is it bad for me if I'm the farmer here? So for the farmer, I check. I'm raising pig, so eventually I would sell the pig to the bacon people. So now I want to check pork price, up or down, which way is bad for me. It's my revenue. When I sell the pig, I get the money from the pork price at market. So if the pork price go up, this is good for me. I'm happy. Pork price go up, I make more money. If pork price go down, this is where it's bad for me, right? So pork price go down, I make less money, I may have actual loss. So for them, from the, on a producer's perspective, my risk is pork price go down, and that's what I want to hedge. So what I need is, I need to make money on the hedge when the pork price go down. So now you have B, C, and D. So you want to check which one gives you that, right? So here, buy and buy is okay. You need to make profit when the price go down. So you buy and buy, either call or put. In this case, call cannot be correct. Call makes you money when the price go up, right? So call gives you money if the price go up, but now I need money when the price go down. So only put will fit this perspective, right? So here I know C is the correct answer. How about D? For D, if I sell commodities futures, do I get the same effect? Actually, I would still do, right? Because if the pork price go down, if I sell the futures, it will also make me money. So in this case, both C and D can be correct, which happens quite a, quite a bit. What's the best answer? Here, for the put, this is what I have, right? For the put, if I'm long the put, I have something like this. If I'm short the futures, I would have, I guess as price go up, it would be like this, right? So here, for the futures, I can buy it or I can sell it to protect me when the price go down. 
But when the price go up, I'm stuck as well. But I don't, I don't want it. I don't want any uh, uh, bad effects when the price go up. So this is really not a hedge on the upside because it takes away the bad side, but also takes away the good. So in this case, buy would be the only buy a put option with only one that's feasible. It protects on the downside as a hedge, but when the prop price go up, I still get the benefits. Right? So here, C and D are both correct, but for hedging purpose, C would be the best answer of the four. Okay? So here, if you go through the process, no calculations, many are common sense. Once you read the curriculum, this will be, uh, it'll be much easier to see than the five minutes we have here. The last two built on the different theories in, in the curriculum. This is on valuation, it's very common. Uh, many analysts in stocks will do the full-blown model for cash flow. They use dividend or some uh, 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 ratios to do a check. They will also use this. It's an option-based model to, to evaluate equity value. Here, it's doing the same, but we have more than one model. They have different assumptions. So here it's checking, if I'm using the black shows model, there's two, another on Merton, which is you know, similar option theory. Which one is the black shows theory based on? So here I'll let you go back and ponder on this, but I think, let me see which one is the right answer. I think B is the right answer here. So it's a different assumption. This is the only one that fits this Black Scholes model, given the way the model is set up. So we don't have the thing, the 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 formula here. So uh, B is the one. If you want to go back and check and look further, this is on value at risk. Here it's more on an allocation purpose. So uh, in your CFA, let's say I give you ten billion dollars cash. What do you buy? What investment do you buy? That's allocation. I buy five billion stocks. 3 billion bonds, 2 billion AI, that's how you allocate, by dollar. Some AI will do a risk-based allocation. I don't look at the, the, the dollar amount to allocate, I do it by risk. So I would uh, uh, put all my money based on different ways to allocate my risk, either equally between different things or based on certain percentage ratios I give. So it's a risk-based allocation instead of dollar-based or return-based. So it's one of the calculations. So here, it's checking how the marginal and components and, and the total value adds up. So once I know this, I know how much in stocks, how much in bonds, how much in AI, given my $10 billion. So here, A is the correct answer. It's more formula-based. You've got two formulas in this to calculate the allocation using risk instead of dollar or return. Right, so here, I'll let you look at these later on. Um, I'll be around for any questions later on, but Janet will go through some of the uh, packages we offer. So thank you, Thomas. Um, my name is Janet. I'm the business manager here. Um, I'm in charge of this Kaya Kai program. And just a bit of introduction. Um, I work with individuals and companies, HRs, um, professional um, bodies like Kai Association on a daily basis to deliver training solutions and make sure that people could upskill in their current jobs as well as getting ready for the next job if you are looking for a career change. So this is what I do. Okay, so I um, think Kaplan, um, we have a very strong history in exam preparation and uh, we are the top provider in Kaya um, exam preparation. Actually, we are the first provider introducing the Kaya destination um, the and the um, corresponding courses and um, study materials to Hong Kong in 2008. So um, since then, we have trained um, hundreds of candidates and helped them to pass the exam. And um, historically, um, our pass rate is much higher than the global average pass rate. And the reason why our students are doing better is, I think, number one, uh, we, our course is very well structured. Uh, we intentionally pace the course and make sure that we could um, um, cover the curriculum 
um, effectively. So this is what we do. And secondly, uh, we have an incredible um, set of course slides, which will help Thomas um, explaining concepts. So um, this is what we will be using. Perhaps I can yeah, share with you and you can take a look. So these are the slides that we'll be using to explain concepts. And also in the slide, you can find um, um, examples which Thomas would use to illustrate um, concepts. All right. And apart from these slides, uh, we also have plenty of questions. So within the slide pack, we already have some questions. But if you want to have uh, more practices, um, this Schweizer practice exam book will go with the course and it uh, co um, contains three mock exams. So between classes, if you want to do practice to validate your understanding, so you could go to this book. And also during classes, like um, Thomas will pick a few questions from here to kind of reinforce what you've learned. So you can take a look at that as well. All right. So and at the end of the course, uh, we will be uh, giving you a mock exam as well. I, I don't have a copy here, but it is a two hour mock exam. And after the mock, we will mark your paper and then um, give you a analysis, ana analysis report. And that will show you which areas you are strong and which areas you're weaker. And then in that way, you know how to spend your last two weeks uh, to study and also, of course, Thomas will go through the questions and make sure that uh, you understand why you get some questions wrong. So this is quite important. Okay. So these are some of the course features. Um, online pre-course. Um, so for those of you who do not have a strong finance background, it is okay. Um, what we're going to help you is we're giving you this online pre-course. Um, going through basic finance concepts. So this will help you to um, kickstart the Kaya program. So this is basic concepts. So it is available when you sign up. You don't have to come here. You can watch it at home or during lunchtime. So this is quite convenient. And the second feature is, of course, the live program that we have. So it's 11 sessions. Um, around 36 hours. So Thomas will be here with you to explain concepts to you. So um, the start date will be July 28th. So this is an important date, July 28th or level one. So it's going to be on Sundays and then plus one Friday. It's June 28th. June, yes, June 28th. So, um, so, and between classes, like I've already talked about um, the practice exam book, but we'll give you additional um, support as well. So for example, the online weekly class, okay, it is recorded by our sister company in the stage Waza. So um, for less important concepts or there are certain concepts that you would like to review, you can go to this online weekly class, okay? So it's very convenient. And also Schweizer Notes ebook. So what I have here is a sample of the printed book. So imagine you have this, you, you will receive this in electronic format. So um, you can take a look. And apart from that, there is a ebook quick sheet. So um, do I have one here? Uh, this is okay, here. Go. So you will receive an electronic copy of the formula sheet here. So uh, um, yes. So this is kind of handy, right? Also, just in case um, you have to miss Thomas' class, it's all right because it will be recorded, and you can come to our media lab on first floor of this building to watch it. So you won't miss any um, sessions here, all right? And the mock exam that I 
um, talked about. It will be on September 5th. All right. And then um, it will be marked and distributed um, on September 6th. And then Thomas will debrief the mock exam. Right. So if you're really interested in our program, these are the dates that you need to remember. Um, I think none of you apply here, right? So if you have taken Kaplan courses before, um, sign up on or before next Monday. So June 15th, um, we are uh, offering alumni discount, okay, to appreciate your loyalty to Kaplan. And also, um, if you don't, you, if you're not qualified for the al alumni discount, um, mark this date, June twenty second. So that is the f the following Monday. Okay, not the coming Monday, but the following Monday, uh, will be the last deadline for the classroom um, early bird discount. All right. So mark this date. So, however, if you're thinking, whoa, um, I have a busy job and Sunday is my family day. I absolutely cannot come to live class. And that's okay. If you prefer a more self-directed approach, um, I've mentioned about Schweza. So they offer a few packages that you can choose from. So um, I recommend the essential package, which contains a lot of um, components that I talked about, Schweza, Nurks, Quick Sheet. And this is the online queue bank, which contains around a thousand multiple choice questions and practice exam and calendar and they have online office hours like a chat room where you could ask questions all right but i think most people would upgrade to this premier instruction program because it comes with the online weekly program all right which comes with the live course but if you don't prefer live then you can do everything online all right and uh, you can also upgrade um, the premium package um, by adding the secret sauce. Secret sauce, um, I think I have a book here. This is kind of a late season product that people would use to kind of go over the key points of the um, curriculum. So you can take a look. So this is a secret sauce book. And there's an online exam here and also the debriefing um, of the exam. So there are many products, like different packages they can choose from. And also, um, if you are a paper person, you prefer printed materials. I think this is uh, most people would choose printed version. But if you would like the best of both worlds, you would like print and online version of Schweizer products. So simply add $200 and you can receive both. So this is very convenient. Okay. So most of the Schweizer products are now available except some of the late season products, all right? So if you're interested, um, you can refer to the brochure. I think everyone has a copy of this, right? So the live course schedule is on page three here. So this is the schedule for live courses. If you're interested in Schweizer products, it's at the back of the brochure and then for you to look at like what are the packages available, what's contained in each package, all right? So um, I will be here all the time, okay, Monday to Friday, and here's my direct line and email address, so feel free to give me a call and send me an email. And or if I'm not in the office, you can call our customer service hotline and our ladies downstairs will be very happy to help you or advise on what to do and which package to buy, how to sign up for a course. So we'll be here to answer your questions. So um, maybe I will wrap up this part here. And if um, do you have any questions regarding um, learning resources and learning support, anything? I think around nine hours total. Uh, no, it's divided into different sections. So I think about six videos. So each video is about an, an hour, a little bit more than an hour. Yes, but you can stop anytime and then replay it. So yeah.
Yeah, I think we could um, our live courses um, accelerate the understanding of the concepts. So I think everyone has 24 hours a day, but if you are reading on your own, perhaps you will spend most of the time reading and try to understand, but you're not too sure whether you get the concept or not. But if you're in our class, then um, Thomas will walk through the concepts with you and make sure that you've finished certain topics um, in the right time and not spending too much time on a particular topic and he will move you on along the way. So I think this is very valuable. So instead of reading the books on your own and Thomas will guide you through the process and if you have extra time, then uh, you, you should, actually you should do a lot of question practice. Yeah. So time and location, yeah. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.
Something apart from the knowledge, I also appreciate that Kai Association, they have a very good network um, of professionals, like from different sectors, different fields, or even investors. So they, I, um, they have regular uh, gatherings on different industry topics and also sh social events as well. So I think it opens up like opportunities for you to meet people, get to know what they're doing in Hong Kong as well. So this is, I, I think apart from the academic, this is one of the best um, benefits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Mm. Yep. Yep. So um, maybe I'll close the seminar here. So thank you very much for coming today. And you can continue to look at the samples if you wish. And then I'll be staying here for some time. So thank you very much. And I hope to see you in the course or in the new f near future in other events or other occasions. So thank you very much.